Okay, here's another recording from the election of 1920, and this was the Democratic candidate, James M. Cox of Ohio. Now, a couple of interesting things about James Cox. First off, he really received very little, if any, endorsement from Woodrow Wilson. He also had on his shoulders all the problems of the Wilson administration, the League of Nations, the operations of the war, uh, basically also the fact that nobody was really totally sure who was running the country at the time because of Woodrow Wilson's broken nature. Everyone knew that basically his surrogate president had become his wife. And as his Mrs. Wilson would basically delegate what the president saw and what the president did not. So all of this was going on. There was a lot of anger about the war. There was a lot of anger about the high and mighty nature of Wilson. And so Cox, with his running mate, Franklin D. Roosevelt, basically had to hurdle this mess and it was a difficult, if not impossible, thing to do. So here he is, making his speech, supporting all that Wilson did, whether he wanted to or not, and basically going and fighting with the sword, defending the actions of the Democratic administration under Woodrow Wilson. One interesting thing about this is James Cox lived a short distance from Warren G. Harding, who was the Republican candidate. They sound very much alike. They have the same kind of accent. And if you really weren't aware, you'd think you were listening to the other. It's kind of fascinating. When you listen to Harding, notice the regional um, similarities in their accents. So without further ado, The World War by James N. Cox, candidate for president, 1920. World War has been fought, historic, unprecedented. For many, many months, civilization hung in the balance. In the despair of dark hours, it seemed as though a world dictator was inevitable, and that henceforth men and women who had lived in freedom would stand at attention in the face of the drawn sword of military autocracy. The very soul of America was touched, as never before, with the fear that our liberties might be taken away. What America did needs no reiteration here. It is known of all men. History will acclaim it. Poets will find it an inspiration throughout the ages. And yet, there is not a line in the Republican platform that breathes an emotion of pride or recites our national achievements. In fact, if a man from Mars were to depend upon the Republican platform or its spoken interpretation by the candidate of that party as his first means of information, he would not find a syllable telling him that the war had been won and that America had saved the world. How ungenerous. How ungracious all of this is. How unfair that a mere group of leaders should no so demean themselves in the name of the party of Lincoln and McKinley and Roosevelt. The discourtesy to President Wilson is an affair of political intrigue. History will make it odious. As well might it be directed at a wounded soldier of the war. One fell in the trench. The strength of the other was broken in the enormous labors of his great office. But others were ignored. The men and women who labored at home with an industry and a skill that words cannot recount. What of the hands that moved the lathe by day and the needle by night? What of the organization, superbly effective? that conserved food and fed the world, that carried nourishment to the very front trench, 
in the face of hell's fury, that nursed the wounded back to life, that buried the dead in the dark shelter of the night, that inspired businessmen and artisans of all parties to work in harmony. What of the millions of men, women, and children of all creeds, religious and otherwise, who stood in the ranks as firm as soldiers overseas, undivided by things they once quarreled about? What of the government itself, confirming the faith of our fathers as sufficient to meet the storms of time? Why the sneer at labor? with a veiled charge that it was a slacker. Republican leaders who have taken charge of their party and nominated its candidates are no more possessed of the spirit of the hour than they were in 1912 when they precipitated a revolution within the rank and file of a great organization. If further proof were needed, the action of the present Congress supplies it. Not a constructive law can be cited. Money and time were wasted in seeking to make a military triumph an odious chapter in history. Yet it is significant that after two years of fruitful inquiry, there was nothing revealed in that vast enterprise carrying billions of dollars in expense upon which they could base even a whisper of dishonesty.